Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Chenny Suleiman, and I'm one of the other co-presidents of the Africa Business Club. I see many of you look like you've had a lot of sleep. That's great. Um, I would like to introduce our first keynote of the day, Mr. Okichuku Enalama. He typically goes by OK. He's in front of the, the, the auditorium. Um, he's the founder and chief executive of Africa Capital Alliance. Mr. Okichuku Enalama is a founder and CEO of ACA, Africa Capital Alliance. He brings private equity experience gained in New York and Johannesburg from Zephyr Capital and South Africa Capital Growth Fund, which is a president of BRAIT. His previous experience was with Arthur Anderson in Nigeria and Goldman Sachs in New York and London. He's a member of the advisory board of Africa Venture Capital Association and the Emerging Markets Private Equity Association. And he's also a fellow of the Aspen Institute. He also currently serves on the board of various companies including eTransact, Cornerstone Insurance, and Business Day. After first qualifying as a medical doctor, impressive, OK qualified as a chartered accountant in Nigeria, winning two national prizes in the qualifying examinations. He has an MBA with high distinction. This is actually no easy feat. Neither of us is going to be one of these. He was a Baker Scholar at Harvard Business School. And he's a chartered financial analyst as well. So please give us a very hearty and warm welcome to Mr. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here. I, um, I have happy memories of Harvard Business School. 20 years ago, when I graduated from HBS, I accepted an offer to work for another HBS alum, Thomas Barry, who at the time was seeking to raise the first private equity fund out of the US for South Africa at the time when Nelson Mandela was about to take up his position as the president of the country. And at that time, even though as is usual here, I had offers to work for some of the usual sort of um, great reputable organizations that recruit from HPS, I thought it was right, it felt right to pursue that entrepreneurial dream. And I'm glad that I did, because I'm still working on that dream even till today. 15 years ago, when this conference was held in 1999, during its very formative years and fledgling years, I was given an award for the pioneering work we had started doing then in African private equity. Today, I've been invited, you've invited me to share my experience of 20 years investing in Africa. I must admit, it is an opportunity I relish, and it is a privilege I do not take lightly. Now, I fully understand that many are looking to us, as um, Professor Dogan told us, many are looking to us as the generation that will make a difference in Africa. Many are looking to us to unlock Africa's potential. And today, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us as a people. I want to challenge us as a group to work together, to partner, to be that generation that will make a difference in Africa. I do agree it will take a long time. That's why I talk about the generation. As you know, a generation is like 30 years. But I think if we start at it now, it's not too late. ABC has become a very important and highly credible platform in this quest to build Africa. And I really want to commend all of you who have been doing this great work at ABC. From its fledgling start 16 years ago, ABC's convening power has grown in leaps and bounds. And so again, I want to say well done to all of you. You are doing a great job. And please keep up this good work. And I pray you will go from strength to strength. In fact, I was thinking about it the other day. And I said one of the benefits of, our, of HP as being a two-year program is that there is always connectivity and connection from one class to the next, and hopefully this momentum will continue. Today, let me, let me just um, share my remarks with you in terms of the theme that we've been given um, about building a vibrant African economy. I'd like to divide my remarks into three sections. First, I'd like to talk about what it takes to build a vibrant African economy. I'd like to share my own experience. One of the things I was told is that like, um, and I think I'm even more convinced, having listened to Catherine, 
that it's important I share my experience with you, what's and all, the things that have worked for me, and the things that I hope, I hope you learn something from it. And then finally, I want to challenge you to say, what is your own opportunity to be part of this African dream? I want to begin um, in talking about the African, the, building a vibrant African economy. I want to begin with an African proverb. Now, I don't know how many of us know this proverb, but it's a proverb that I like, or I might even say I love, because it says, you can't be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. Now, I'm told that in Africa, when you give a proverb, you're not supposed to explain it. <laughs> you know, because if you, if you, if, if you have to be explained to you, it means that you're an outsider, but I recognize that we have a mixed audience. <laughs> so let me say a couple of things about this proverb that are directly applicable to us. What this proverb is saying, and I think it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite insightful, is that our perceived weaknesses, our perceived weaknesses may well provide the opportunity and the motivation we need to build the Africa of our dreams. And I want to challenge us to think about that as we go through, as, as I go through my presentation, because I want, to, I want to point out three areas where we are perceived to be weak, but also three areas that potentially may well have the opportunity for the growth that Africa can experience and will experience over this next century. Now, these three things, I have called them three necessary and sufficient conditions. And I, and I use both of those words uh, advisedly. It is my view, based on everything I've learned, my experience on the continent, and even my time at HPS, including the Biggie course, that if we get our human capital development right, get the enabling environment and integrity and discipline that I think we can achieve the Africa of our dreams. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this is a big challenge. But I'm also optimistic that this is a, a war we can win. But a war it is. It is a war you know, to deal with the issues around our human capital development. It is a war to deal with issues around creating the right enabling environment for business to prosper and for people to reach their full potential. It is a war to create an environment where integrity and discipline are the driving values of the society that we seek to build. But I fully believe that it is a winnable war. I believe it is a war we can and should win. Now, let me go on to talk a bit about human capital development, which is one of those three key factors. And I return to ancient China, or to a Chinese proverb this time. I'm sure this is something we're all familiar with. I've been told by those who should know that the word danger, or sorry, crisis in China, or in Chinese, you know, has um, two sides, it's two sides of the same coin. The same word can mean danger, and the same word can mean opportunity. You know, it's interesting that the Nigerian case is called either opportunity in crisis, or certainly opportunity and crisis are mentioned in the same breath. And in a sense, this is, um, this is, this is very wise, because as Catherine said to us, if you think about the youth, the African youth, what do you make of the African youth? You know, at one level, we are talking about youth unemployment. We are talking about the widening income disparity. Some people have called it a ticking time bomb. You know, I mean, you can think about the Arab Spring, for instance. And yet, properly addressed, this thing could yield all kinds of dividends, as we were told earlier this morning. You know, the so-called population and demographics dividend will come out of the same African youth that we're talking about. So the, a lot depends on what we do with what we have. Yeah, so if you go on to this, um, if you go on to this graph, what is, it, I think um, Catherine covered this very well. One of the interesting things about the chart up there is notice how many African countries in 2050 are in the top 10 most populous countries in the world, three. You know, you see Nigeria there, you see Ethiopia, you see DRC. African continent, Africa as a continent is also expected to make a fairly dramatic shift in terms of its population. And there is a growing consensus that population matters in the wealth of nations. Of course, a lot depends on what you do with it, but population does matter. But there is a challenge. When you think about African population, it's not just having the population per se that yields the dividend, it's what you do with it, back to human capital development. 
what are we going to do with our population? If you look at this graph, it says that like, in terms of tertiary education and just human capital development, Africa still lags behind most of the other regions of the world. And this is something that we must get right if we're going to reach our full potential. The question I have for us is that can the 21st century be the African century? That will only happen if we invest massively in human capital development. So I think ABC is quite right to say, let's focus on human capital development. And as Catherine said earlier, it's not just about, you know, sort of doing an MBA in the elite business schools. It's also about, you know, training people, you know, to be productive. It's also about making the most of the lives of people and helping people reach their full potential. Let me go on to the second factor that you need to create a vibrant African economy. And this is the enabling environment. I'm sure many of us may have read the book Outliers, The Story of Success by um, Malcolm Gladwell. I mean, one of the key insights from that book, and I wouldn't say it's an original insight, it's one that has been with us for a long time, is that context matters. In fact, the biggie course at HBS is the same thing it teaches, context matters. We know from experience we know from experience that no individual or nation develops in a vacuum. Nobody develops in a vacuum. Context matters. When I attended the ABC conference during those fledgling years or those early years, 15 years ago, they had a keynote speaker. I think his name was uh, Kwesi Bochwe, a former finance minister of Ghana. And one of the arguments he made then, which is still relevant today, is that, it's, that we have to move beyond the basic forms of capital like commodities, you know, to the higher levels of capital. He talked about reputational capital, he talked about relationship capital, he talked about human capital at its peak, at its best. It's interesting that today, we're still dealing with the same sort of challenges. And I believe it will be very wise to think in terms of people, not just in terms of minerals, you know, beneath the ground and so on. Because people will make the difference. I think our greatest asset, and I know that it's a bit of a hackneyed expression or a cliche, our greatest asset has to be our people. And investing in our people is what will unlock Africa's potential. But we also need to build the infrastructure that it takes to create a vibrant economy. And by infrastructure, I'm not just talking about hard infrastructure like roads and, and so on. I'm talking about soft infrastructure as well. I'm talking about rule of law, property rights, and so on. You know, one of the reasons why I'm so optimistic about Nigeria's future is that we're finally tackling the electric power deficit and problem. And how are we tackling it? By inviting private capital and private partnership, or partnership with, with the private sector, to partner with the government and with the country to unlock the power. Because without it, I don't think there's enough resources that government can muster to do that on its own. This leads me to the subject of capital as part of an enabling environment. One of the things we know is that capital flows to where it will earn a good return. And it's not something that um, one has to be overly defensive about. And it's just something that we have to understand. And I believe that like, it's only wise, given the enormity of the resources that are needed, that we continue to have this type of dialogue about how to create the right partnership between the various stakeholders, government, private sector, civil society, and all. You know, I know that um, today, later today, that we're going to have somebody from GE speak to us, GI Island. I know that General Electric recently has been doing a lot in the power sector in Africa, and in Nigeria in particular. And I'm sure he'll tell us a lot about that. I think that is the right approach. I believe that there is power in partnership. And I believe that like, we can create win-win partnerships that would develop the African continent and the African economies. On a more optimistic note, one of the thoughts I want to leave us with, which is the last thought on this slide, is the power of adversity. Adversity can actually propel nations forward. Adversity can actually propel people forward. Like the African proverb says, you can be shorter than me, sorry, you can be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. If I'm suffering and I make the use of that suffering, I'm sure you've had the expression that a crisis is too good an opportunity to waste. You know, and in a sense, this is highly applicable to Africa today. A lot of the challenges we're dealing with can be turned into opportunities. And it all has to do with what do you do with the adversity. And one of the thoughts I want to leave us with is that we can make adversity become a good thing instead of a bad thing if it is, if it is used well. That leads me to the last that leads me to the last um, sort of um, factor that we need to address if we're going to unlock Africa's potential. And that has to do with the whole subject of integrity and discipline. And I talk about integrity and discipline because in my own experience, and I speak from having been in, working in the continent now for, over, for, over, for about 20 years, 
you know, if you bring integrity and you bring discipline, you can do well in the long term. As um, you know, Catherine told us, it's extremely important that we think long term. One of the challenges is this short term you know, versus delayed gratification. And I believe that it is wise to delay gratification and stick to one's values. One of the lessons we learned from the Singapore story, if you've read um, Lee Kuan Yew's book, is they took the view very early on that corruption could be a problem if not addressed squarely. They took the view that the system must reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. If there's one thing we've learned through the ages is that man is self-interested. That's where the agency theory of man comes. I mean, in fact, it was one of the courses when I was here. They used to have this, gen, this man at the, then uh, called uh, Professor Jensen, Michael Jensen. I don't know if he's still here. I'm sure that he's probably gone. But I will tell you that one of the key points he tried to make then, which Adam Smith made maybe a century before him, is that like, man is self-interested. And we have to create systems that reward people for doing what is right, not systems that appeal to people to do it for irrational reasons, because man ultimately is somewhat rational. And the other thing I want to talk about is the subject of discipline, because there's a lot of talk about strategies. We have all these discussions going on, not just here, but all over the world. But I think ultimately, people care about what you do, not what you say you will do. And I think, really, what it means is that we must work the talk if we're going to, if we're going to make the most of, our, of the opportunity we have. Let me use a case study to end this section before I, I share my experience with you. And I use this case study, which is on Union Bank, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment we made recently. Union Bank, in many respects, is a microcosm of what can go wrong and how you fix it, be it for a nation, even though it's a bank, but I think it has a lot of parallels with a lot of the issues we've dealt with in, in Africa. You know, Union Bank was started about 100 years ago by, I mean, by Barclays Bank, or a predecessor to Barclays Bank. And at, for many years, it was, it was one of the top two banks in Nigeria. And then a number of things happened. First, during the indigenization program in the 70s, Barclays was kicked out. In effect, there was a, a feeling that we could go it alone. We didn't need help. And Barclays left. One of the things that followed was they stopped investing in people. The investment that was needed to develop the human capital of the bank suffered a lot. And then, agency problem kicked in. Self-interest was put above everything else. People tried to defend their own narrow self-interest rather than the broader and greater good of everybody. And what was the consequence? The bank lost competitiveness and had a hole of over 300 billion or $2 billion in its shareholder funds. And in fact, the opportunity came for us to invest when the central bank intervened. And I, I use it as a case study because what we have had to do is to literally go back and provide the right context by having the right um, sort of um, governance around the bank, by having the right people there, and we are beginning to invest in the people again. And of course, you know, creating a system of checks and balances. And I believe that Union Bank will come back um, from, from, from its um, lost glory because the investment is being made to achieve that. That is a good segue. That's a good opportunity for me to then share my experience with you. As you see from my personal experience, I hope you've picked up the three principles I've talked about. I call them principles because, in a sense, these things are unarguable. You know, number one is that you have to develop human capital, whether it's at the individual level, at the company level, or even at the country or Africa level. You know, number two, context matters. Nobody does it in a vacuum. And of course, number three, if you bring integrity and discipline over the long term, you will succeed, you will win. You know, and I would like to share a few personal stories as I share my experience. I start with education, talking about human capital development. I went to a, you know, a famous secondary school um, in, in Nigeria called Government College in Omaha. I call it famous because Chino Achabe wrote about it. If you're reading his book, <laughs> Chino Achabe went to the same school, the great Chino Achabe. If you, wrote, if you read his book, There Was a Country, he talked about Government College Omaha as just a great school. And it used to be a great school. In fact, a number of us are working right now to restore the school because it's no longer the great school it was. And the concern I have today is that Government College Omaha is no longer producing the kind of people who can end up in Harvard Business School. And we need to make sure that we give forward by investing back. Those of us that have had the opportunity of going there. And then from there, I went to University of Nigeria. Univers University of Nigeria was also considered one of the great universities of Nigeria, not considered was. I, it probably still is one of the great universities of Nigeria. The interesting thing is I went there to study medicine. Why did I go there to study medicine? Because at the time I went to school, in the 70s when I got into medical school, 
you know, there was an, what I call a romance of the professions. It looked like the path to you know, greatness and glory was medicine, law, architecture, and stuff like that. We didn't know much about business at the time, I guess. So I got into medicine. But the interesting story I want to tell you about my medical detour is that how did I end up in business? Because there is, a, there, is a, there is a message I want to drive through here, which is this importance of the power of desire. By the time I finished medicine, I don't know where it came from, but I developed a strong desire to pursue a business career. You know, having spent six years in medicine, having done uh, my internship and, and all that, I came to the conclusion that what I really wanted to do was to be a business person and to pursue a career in finance. I believe in destiny because I can't actually tell you rationally where that inspiration came from, but it came from somewhere. Now, I got lucky, and that's why I'm talking about desire, because once I had that desire, I went to see a sister who was working for one of the multinationals, and she had just lost a colleague to the firm Arthur Anderson. And I said, what happened? They said, because this guy, um, you, this guy was an engineer. And they said, well, Anderson, Arthur Anderson, the American firm that is no more, accounting firm, was recruiting non-accountants to train them to be, to be business people. And I asked, what about me? Would they accept doctors? And to cut a long story short, I was given the contact information. And when I contacted them, um, they eventually hired me. But I believe that it's all about the desire that drove that. The second story I'd like to tell us is about how I got admitted into, uh, how I got admitted to Harvard Business School. Same power of desire. By the time I was leaving to join Anderson, leaving the medical profession, I had a good friend I had gone to university with. We played a lot of Scrabble. I mean, I remember we used to stay awake all night playing Scrabble. But anyway, this my friend was seeking to come to the US to pursue the golden fleece, as we say. And he really wanted to come to HBS. He ended up going to another business school. But he was the first person to tell me about HBS. And he said, oh, I would like to go there. And he occurred to me, even though my business career was barely starting, that would be nice. That would be an, a nice endorsement, having left medicine. <laughs> my friend ended up not coming to HBS. But when I joined Anderson, I had a lucky break. Anderson was, the, was doing the accounting or the audit of, of the Harvard Business School Alumni Association in Nigeria. He was doing the accounting work for them pro bono. And I asked the manager on the work, can I do the work just to get closer to the school? He said, sure. <laughs> you know, and um, I went to do this work, and the man who was the treasurer that year, under alum of the school, the treasurer, I asked him, how do people go to Harvard Business School? <laughs> and he told me, young man, do your work, and in the evening, come and see me. So I finished my work. In the evening, I went to see him. He sat down. He was having some beer, and he started talking to me. He, he asked me, have you spoken to Dick Kramer about it? And I'll get to Dick Kramer later. And I said, no. Dick is my chairman. He used to be my boss at the time. And Dick had gone to Harvard Business School as well. He said, talk to him, because he went there. His two sons went there. And I said, Dick would discourage me. He would like me to continue to work for Anderson. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he gave me several reasons why people come to HBS, you know, from the global perspective, which is the one I took away. Because for me, coming to this place was, was quite transformative. It, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, um, it made a huge difference. I always tell people that like, one of the things he did for me, and the case study method has a lot to do with that, is that by the time you go through all these cases and have all these classmates, you actually receive education at Harvard Business School because you don't go back the same way you came. And for that reason, I will always be grateful to this school. Anyway, to the, the point I'm making is that that desire to go to HBS eventually propelled me to get in here. And I want to challenge us, whether we're thinking about Africa as a continent, or we're thinking about individual careers, or we're thinking about you know, whatever, it's extremely important that you allow the power of desire to work for you. Because in my own life, if there is one thing that has propelled me forward, it has been the desire, and then pursuing those my dreams with passion. Sorry, I, I jumped a slide. <laughs> I, we'll get there, don't worry. Don't be in a hurry, we'll get there. Like, don't, don't be, we'll get there soon. But let's talk about context. Remember, I'm dealing with the principles of human capital. Now I'm dealing with context. The reason I'm showing this slide, or I show you this slide, is because nobody emerges in a vacuum. Nobody emerges in a vacuum. You know, I've been extremely fortunate and blessed in the places I have worked and the training I have received. And I believe as Africans, we need to channel that education, that training, back to the continent, because that's how the continent is going to develop. If you, people talk about Asia. That's what happened in Asia. When we were here, Asians were all over America and all over the world. And they have taken all that knowledge and all that expertise and experience back to Asia. And that's why Asia is working. I believe we have to do the same as well for Africa. And that's one of the reasons why I went back to Africa after business school. Now, let me also say that the other thing I want you to take away from this slide, in addition to 
that you don't emerge in a vacuum is that you can be propelled by adversity. When people talk about their careers, it always looks as if it was very smooth. But I'll tell you a story. Having graduated you know, with top honors from HBS, I, and I, like I told you, I had all kinds of offers. One of the things he did for me was that in negotiating with Tom Barry, for the dean at the time, even assisted me in, in those negotiations. But in negotiating with this, my boss at the time, you know, I got what looked like a good deal. I mean, I, I, was, I was made a promise that if we raise the fund, you know, I'll become part of the general partners of the firm, right? I'll become one of the junior partners of the firm. Unfortunately, we raised the money. I got to South Africa as a young guy who had never done private equity, had done accounting, remember I was a doctor. So, you know, still inexperienced in business, apart from maybe the MBA education I had received. And my colleagues there just said, how did you end up being a junior partner in a firm one year out of business school? Because it took us about a year to raise the money. And what that meant was that, like, I came under a lot of scrutiny. I came under a lot of scrutiny in terms, and, and I was learning. I was going through the apprentice, apprenticeship, I was learning. But they kept reminding me about, you know, how little I knew. And that adversity was actually what led to the start of African Capital Alliance. Because at this stage, I asked myself, really, you know, wouldn't it be nice after having done this for a few years, rather than sitting here and coasting along, to actually take it back home and go further north and do it in Nigeria and the rest of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's actually part of my story on how African Capital Alliance started. Why do I tell you this story? You can be propelled by adversity. My colleagues from South Africa today are some of my best friends. We are still very good colleagues, but that challenging me you know, to be the best and challenging me to make the most of my career propelled me forward because it, they didn't give me an easy ride. Why do I have this picture of Abacha, General Abacha? Still talking about adversity. This was, you know, we started African Capital Alliance in the midst of adversity, 1997, 1998. We had General Abacha there, you know, um, and we had all kinds of uncertainty. Nigeria was a paria nation. It wasn't a place to be at the time. But I believe in the power and discipline of contrarian thought. The reason why I chose to go back at that time was one, I found I had the right partners. I found that like, even though that we had a difficult government, there were people within Nigeria, including multinationals, that needed to invest their capital anywhere. And I had the kind of skills and experience that was relevant. And frankly, you know, then there was no competition. So I went back, and just to tell you the power of contrarian thinking, the private equity fund we started then returned over 15 times the invested capital because it came in at a time when prices were very low, because the environment was not a very friendly one. So like we say in Africa, you cannot be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. Always look beneath the surface. The fact that something doesn't look right, including the issues with Africa, may well be the opportunity that we have as Africans and as people interested in Africa to fix Africa. Sorry. Now, I, I mean, these are just further illustrations of what ACA has achieved. If you look at this slide, it talks about, you know, just the, 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 the value investing. And the reason I wanted to talk a bit about value investing is that contrarian thinking and value investing go hand in hand. I'm sure, there are, I'm sure there are some of us here who believe in value investing. It's something we believe in deeply. I believe in it deeply, and, I be, and we believe in it as a firm. You know, and it makes the case for depth versus breadth. In other words, for you to be a good value investor, you have to understand what you're investing in. You know, for you to know the value of something, you have to know it enough to know what it's worth. You know, the same thing applies. I remember when I was at HBS and we had Warren Buffett come speak to us. One of the points he made to us, he said, look around your classmates. If there were securities, if there were stocks, which of them would you buy? And he was trying to train us to think about people as investments. Because we invest in people. People are the greatest asset you can invest in. You know, and in a sense, he was challenging us to take time to understand people, to take time to invest and to trust people. You know, and the same thing applies to businesses. You know, the other cornerstone of value investing, as you know, is margin of safety principle. What does this mean? It means that like, when you understand something enough, you know not to drive too close to the edge. And it's one of the things you have to do. And it's one of the things that helps us when you're operating in a difficult environment, to still do the investments we do and to still do it well. And then the other thing I have there is about being on the ground. And I will end on this note when I finish. It's extremely important to be close enough to the opportunity. A lot of people talk about Africa, but one of the interesting signs why I'm optimistic about Africa is that people actually, when I, when I lived in the US, I mean, many years ago when I was in business school and so on, people talked about it, but nobody was prepared to go home. They just wanted to talk about it. <laughs> but that has changed. I mean, there is a real interest in returning to Africa. 
And trust me, that is a very, very good sign. That is why I'm confident that the people in this room, many of whom are interested in coming back, will be the ones that will build Africa of our dreams. Yesterday, when I was coming to register, I rode in a cab with you know, um, an American lady who maybe was living somewhere in the DC area, who told me she's moving to Lagos in July. I was stunned. I said, what are you coming to do there? She said she's launching, I'm sure she's probably in the audience. She said she's launching some kind of electronic commerce um, um, business, and she wants to do it in Africa because that's where she sees the opportunity. That's a very powerful sign. And I believe that like, this generation will build the Africa of our dreams. Let me conclude on the note of disciplined investing because when you invest with discipline, you will find that like, the kind of returns you get can be extraordinary. We got over 40 times money invested in MTN, over four and a half times to five times money invested in ABC Transport, which is a local entrepreneur. I'm just trying to say that the returns are there for those that are prepared and willing to venture and to make the investment that is necessary. But you must come with discipline and you must come with integrity, which then leads me to this same principle of integrity and discipline. I was so happy when Catherine was speaking, uh, Professor Dogan was speaking, and she spoke about this idea of taking a long-term view because it's completely in alignment with my thinking and the thinking of my chairman, Dick Kramer. Here is a quote from him. If you apply the right success formula for long enough, you will succeed, particularly in Nigeria, because he's been applying it in Nigeria since 1978. That's when he came to Nigeria. And he has trained a generation, maybe over 1,500 professionals, and has worked with all kinds of people to give back to that country. So the key is to have the right formula. But when you have the right formula, you have to give it time to work. The story of Mandela we read or we heard today, it's, it's a well-told story. They knew that the right thing for South Africa was a multi-racial democracy, but they had to stay at it in prison for 27 years. They did not give up because they had the right formula and ultimately they prevailed. We will also prevail if we do not go into denial but stick to what is right for Africa and apply that success formula long enough in Africa. I think the results will show. And that's what this conference should be talking about. Now, let me, I, I mentioned Dick Kramer, and the reason I show him is because his relationship with me, or the relationship I have with him, is one that demonstrates that context matters. Remember, this was the managing partner of Arthur Anderson? You know, relationships matter. Relationships are some of the highest levels of capital. My own relationship capital, it certainly includes Dick Kramer. I mean, I met this man in 1988. You know, he helped me come to Harvard Business School. In fact, he was the, um, um, I guess, the guarantor of my loan, because I took loans when I came here. And after that, because of that relationship, we ultimately came together again to build African Capital Alliance. And, and I've learned a lot from following an older, wiser person. One of his guiding principles is there. He says, constancy of purpose and consistency in action. What we in Nigeria will call no shaking. <laughs> you know, Dick is completely unflappable. You know, he's one of the most resilient people I've met. In fact, if I wanted to quote uh, Nassim Talib, I would say he's anti-fragile. You know, which means he's, he works stronger with time and with difficulty. I want to challenge us to be the kind of people that, that, um, that can be described that way, no shaking. You know, don't get rattled easily. Remember that adversity can propel you forward. You know, if you have the staying power, there is nothing that you confront you can't deal with. You cannot be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. A crisis is too good an opportunity to waste. You have to make the most of the things that life will throw at you. As we have been told, you can't always predict all the things that will come your way. But you can approach life with the kind of optimism and positive energy that says that the very challenges I face, like the African proverb says, will be the things that will propel me forward. Because if I'm that short, then maybe I'm closer to the ground. And if there's something to be picked up, I'm going to pick it up first. <laughs> I'll get there before you. So as we begin to conclude, let me end by challenging you to think about your own opportunity your own opportunity to be part of this vibrant African economy that we're talking about, your own opportunity to make a difference. And in doing that, I would like to start with a quote from our very own Oprah that challenges us to run our own race. He says, the way to step up your game is not to worry about the other guy in any situation. You just need to run the race as hard as you can. You need to give it everything you have got all the time for yourself. To yourself be true. If you will focus on running your own race, this is a contrarian thought, because that's not the natural thing you expect. You will think that if I'm going to win, then I have to be very careful what everybody else is doing. I have to be very mindful. But that's not what life teaches. Life is very contrarian. 
what life teaches is that those people who focus on running their own race and running it as hard as they can are the ones who win the race, not the ones who are busy trying to figure out what the rest of the people are doing. I want to challenge you to follow your passion. That's why I shared with you my own, my own story and my own experience. I want to challenge you to pursue your desire, to pursue your dream. You know, don't let people intimidate you in this place. Because, I mean, there's a lot of peer pressure, even at Harvard Business School. But I remember when I was leaving, lots of people who are going to work for McKinsey, Goldman Sachs. I said I was going to work for Tom Barry, Tom who? <laughs> but today, I'm glad that I pursued my dream. I want to challenge you to pursue your dream. This is a good time to be in Africa. This is actually a very good time to be in Africa. But in order to make the most of it, I want to leave you with the same three thoughts that have been happening on all day in this presentation. One is be careful what you desire, because you might just get it. I believe so much in the power of desire. Remember, you can accomplish almost anything if you truly desire it. That's the power of desire. Number two, let the adversity you will face, and you will face adversity. It's always naive to assume that your life will be smooth sailing. Everybody faces one challenge or the other at some point. The question is, what are you going to do with it when the challenge comes calling? When you do face adversity, let it propel you forward. Remember that that is one of the key insights that life teaches, that you can profit from adversity. You can be challenged by adversity, and it can bring out the best in you. And finally, run your own race. It is a marathon. As Professor Duggan told us today, it's not a 100-meter dash. You know, like Mandela, choose your own long walk to freedom or to liberty or to wealth or to your dream. And as you do so, you'll find that like, the power of compound interest will work for you. You know, there's such a thing as the power of compound interest. For the students of finance here, you know what I'm talking about. You know, perseverance will win the race eventually. So as we begin to conclude, what are the thoughts I want to leave you with? I think it was a, one of the senior partners of Anderson that said many years ago, and actually he, he applied this to Spain, but it's very applicable to Nigeria today, sorry, to Africa and Nigeria today. It takes only one committed generation, because Spain was a basket case, you know, in the 60s or so. But it was completely rebuilt. I know that it's gone through its problems again, but it's returning. But he said it takes only one committed generation to build a nation or to build a continent like Africa. The question is, why not this generation? Why not you? Why not me? The second quote may even be more familiar. I'm sure you've heard this quote from John Kennedy and also Robert Kennedy quoted the same thing. There are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask, why not? The 21st century can be the African century. Let us dream of things that never were and ask, why not? Why not Africa in the 21st century? Why not you? Why not this generation? One final thought. Let me end where I started. 20 years ago, when Tom Barry, when Tom Barry came calling, I accepted the offer and you know, raised the fund for Africa, and I moved to South Africa and then to Nigeria. In other words, I showed up. When we got, I remember when we got off the plane, Tom and myself, I remember what he said to me, he was so excited. He told me, okay, life, more than 50% of success in life is showing up. I'm told that um, with the Allen, it's actually more than 80, or maybe 80% is actually showing up. I want to challenge you to show up. It's good to have the dialogue in the cold weather of Boston, but we'll have to go to the heat of Africa and get on with this assignment. And as you do so, you find that like the 21st century will be the African century. Have a great conference. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. So at this time, we're actually going to switch over to the Q&A um, session. That was a, a great discussion. Um, so we're going to keep the flow going. Um, please note that we have two microphones on both sides. So we ask that you line up, and we're calling you one-on-one. -on -one. And for those who heard me yesterday, you know we have three ground rules uh, for, for questions. One, your question must be in question format. Uh, so it will be an actual question there. Two, avoid speeches. Um, um, with your question, we'll leave that for the keynotes. Um, and then three, try and limit yourself to one question each, so there'll be time for others to also get in. So, and now we'll sit to that session. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those compelling words. Um, Obi Onyegoro, Standard Chartered Bank. 
So African Capital Alliance is one of the great success stories of African private equity. Um, and what you did was impressive. So my question is, African Capital Alliance is a Nigeria-based, sub-Saharan Africa-focused investment firm. So what is the long-term vision for your firm, and how do you plan on achieving it? And second part of that question is, you mentioned Dick Kramer is one of your mentors. So how do you participate in mentoring others, um, aside from me always harassing you by email? <laughs> Both are excellent questions. I'm sure you had the questions. One is, what is the vision for African Capital Alliance and how we grow, and how do I give back? Having been mentored, how am I going to mentor other people? I think on the first question, um, I believe there are two ways to grow. You can do deep first and then broad later. Or you can broaden first and deepen later. We have chosen you know, to go deep first and then broaden. In other words, if you look at uh, Nigeria today, we are clearly the leading private equity firm, and I will argue even in West Africa. You know, our vision clearly is to be one of the premier, if not the premier private equity firm in Africa. But like we are told today, one of my favorite pieces of advice, take a long-term view. I mean, if it takes 30 years to get there, that's fine. You know, and for me, I believe that success is not just about winning alone. I mean, I would love to have other private equity firms. We want to build a continent. I mean, who wants to be the only private equity firm in China or in Asia? If that happens to you, it means that the market is too small. So in a sense, we want to have many players, including people in this room and, and elsewhere, work together to build the Africa of our dreams. And we certainly think there's enough success to go around. That's point number one. When it comes to mentoring, I'm extremely passionate about mentoring. Those of you that know me know that that's, that's my passion. And that's something I'm committed to. And when it comes to mentoring, I always tell people that you, the mentee or the protege or the person that needs mentoring, you have to draw from the mentor. You are the one that will draw it out. So even though I've said this about Dick, I got what I wanted from Dick. I took things to him, and in doing so, the relationship developed over time. And it's the same thing with me. I think people that want to draw things from me, I'm very happy to give those things where needed. All right. Um, you've mentioned about uh, facing challenges when venturing into private equity in Nigeria before, and you've done business since then till now, and you're still uh, g going strong. Um, what are the kind of challenges that you faced then that you think have improved right now? Have there been any improvements, if I should ask? And which are the biggest challenges that you faced and that still continue right now? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the question is um, the adversity we faced then and how the times have changed or things have changed. I mean, first, starting from the environment, obviously, is much better today. And in many respects, one of the key, shall I say, messages I hope I left is one of the benefits of contrarian thinking is that like, when things look the hardest, they, that may be the darkest hour before the dawn, right? So in going in at that time, you know, um, General Abacha, as you know, I didn't say so, but died soon after that. He died in, in the middle of 1998, and the market opened up, and we actually benefited from that market. And so the challenge one faces every day when you're operating in the kind of environments we're operating is that would you stick to your values? Would you live up to what you believe in? You know, for instance, I'm, I mean, both as a firm and as an individual, Ethics matters to us. We're very keen to pursue integrity, you know, to live a life of discipline. And you may face challenges, and when you face those challenges, you have to stick to what you believe in, even if it means taking a, long a longer term view to life. Secondly, you, know, you operate in an environment where implementation can be difficult. And therefore, the issue of discipline, the issue of being able to actually get things done. When I was coming back to Nigeria, people used to tease me and say, well, Harvard MBA doesn't apply here. In other words, you know, you, all this education is not relevant. I mean, this is, this is a difficult, but that's actually not true. The principles that are taught in this place are relevant because you have to be willing to stick it out and it's all about staying power. And my sense is that if you do that, you find that you will win. But the environment is getting better. There's every reason for optimism. There's every reason to believe that you and I can build the Africa of our dreams. Thank you. Shane Suleiman, Harvard Business School. Uh, my question is around, I think, a question that's top of mind for me and I think many others. So I'm going back to Nigeria as well, and I think I'll be thrown into a position where I'm making decisions that um, I could be swayed in different directions. Uh, so when many of us live here, we feel like we're principled in some ways. When we go back home, people tell you you're being too upright. And so in your, can you share some of your experiences around how do you navigate the system of corruption as you do business, and what are some of the ways you can avoid that? Great question around how do you navigate the environment in terms of uprightness, probity, integrity, and so on. 
when people say you don't understand, you think they don't understand. So who is wrong? Who's right and who is wrong? What I would say is that um, there are a couple of ideas that I learned from here, just to give you an example, that I think are directly relevant to that question. One of the great courses here talks about the principle of strategic alignment. In other words, when you are doing things, they should be internally consistent. They should, be, they should pull in the same direction. The company you keep, the kind of work you take on, you know, the, 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 you know, the kind of choices you make. There's no point wanting to be upright, and then the guy you're working with is the, most, is the opposite of upright. Maybe the, you know, the, 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 the wrong choice for, for, for uprightness, right? <laughs> you know what I mean. Now, it's very important that like, you choose. You have to be highly selective. You should be selective in who you work for. You should be selective in who your friends are. You have the power of choice. Exercise it. You, know, you choose what to do. Now, when you do that, you find that there's a growing community of people that want to do the right thing. In fact, in my business, where we are uh, attracting capital from the international community, the so-called LPs, as you know, they're all over the world. You know, one of the reasons why they give us capital is because they know that our ethics and our probity is fine. So that becomes a competitive advantage. You can't be taller than me and shorter than me at the same time. I keep going back to that. So that thing that one is doing actually becomes a positive um, value-adding quality to, to, to your business. And then the second thing is, again, what Professor Dogan said about take a long-term view. You know, because one of, the, one of the reasons why people compromise in the short term, or well, compromise because of the short term gains, they just can't wait. Patience can be rewarding. And I think if you will be patient and you take a long-term view and you are aligned in terms of the choices you make, I think you'll find that like, you'll do just fine. I think so. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, Demo Ozong from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so s when people talk about private equity in Africa, they often talk about the difficulty in exits. You obviously had success in that. Could you talk about uh, some of the things that you guys have done and also just private equity in general has changed over the past 15, 20 years in Africa? That's the difficulty of exits and, and the challenges. I think that's true in the sense that one shouldn't assume that exits will be easy in, a market, in, in markets where capital markets and financing um, is not readily or easily available. But having said that, because of a challenging environment, when you build great businesses, you know, they sell at a premium. That's also why people are concerned that prices over overpriced or assets overpriced, because you know, when you have great businesses in Africa, you actually command a premium. Great people in Africa command a premium. You know? So even as individuals, by living your life right, you will command a premium, because people are looking, you know, because of the demand for such businesses or such people. And that's something to take to heart. Obviously, without getting technical, before we go into the businesses, we do structure our exits going in, right? So we structure exits from multiple options. Nobody goes into a private equity investment in Africa, or indeed anywhere in the world, without planning how he gets out. I think it goes with the trade. And part of that process has to do with you know, documenting it, right? But also, like I said, building great businesses and then being um, sort of responsive to the opportunity when it comes. Because markets go through cycles. In our own, we've exited more than 15 investments of the 30 investments we've made in our 16-year career. And um, they've come, whenever we've had opportunity, we've used it. And I think you'll find that like, people do eventually get by. And this principle applies to all of life as well. If you take a long-term view, you'll get opportunities to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. One more. OK, we'll take one more, I'm told. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much for speaking mm -hmm. with us. It was a great uh, insight that you shared. I have a very concrete question. Um, I'm planning to move back to Nigeria in May. One of the things my parents always told me is best to learn from mistakes of others than to make the mistake to yourself. But when you see people, let's say a foreign trainer who have worked abroad and lived abroad, and they move back to the continent on a continental scale, what are the common mistakes that you see people like me making, like either in business from the people you've hired or like the, from, a perspective, persp from a perspective point of view, like do we have like, what are those common mistakes that you see that could be avoidable um, in when we make the entry back into the continent? I think my, in my own experience, I can, speaking from my experience, the most important thing, and this is more an affirmative statement than sort of negative, is, you know, you have a choice. If you're going to come back, I think you should think in terms of who, first who, in other words, who are the people that will be around you? Then what? What am I going to be doing? For what reason am I coming back? Am I coming back to work for a private business? Am I coming back to go to government? Am I coming back to set up? First who, then what? Then think in terms of how and when. You know, how am I going to go about it? 
Don't be naive. One of the mistakes people make is just being naive. I mean, in those days, we used to talk about what they call, what we call a mezzanine complex. Let me go and fix Africa. I mean, it's not that easy to fix, you know. So I think one has to be modest in your ambition, but, you know, take a long-term view, as we are told. I think if you think in terms of who, you know, first who, then what, and then you think of how and when, timing. Timing is important. As you know, some people say 90% of wisdom is timing. It might be good to go back, but you have to time it right. I think if you do those things and you have to stay in power, I think you'll be okay. It's very important, you know, to surround yourself with the right, you know, just be in the right network. Be in the right network. That's why I think the who question, for me, is the most important one. Because the person that hangs out with wise people will be wise. I'm sure you've had that expression before. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you.